creative cities, encompassing diverse range of cultural, artistic, and creative activities have been gaining increasing attraction in the context of boosting city competitiveness and pandemic recovery. In this context, TDLC is organizing an event series to explore the new concept of creative city, cities. Today, we are delighted to kick off the first instrument of this event series with the support of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, better known as UNESCO. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, so we hope to share with you some key insights emerging from the recently published report, Cities, Culture, and Creativity, and also hope that you can explore with us on how creative cities can serve as a driver of economic and social development. A short housekeeping announcement before we get started. This webinar will be conducted in English, but we do offer simultaneous English to Japanese interpretation. For those who wish to listen in Japanese, please click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select the Japanese language option. Throughout the sessions, please feel free to drop any questions or comments to our speakers into the chat space. We will have Q&A time at the end of the announcing. So Ahmed is also co-author of the World Bank UNESCO position paper on city culture and creativity. Without further ado, over to you, Ahmed. Thank you, Haruka. Good morning, everyone. It's my honor to be with you today to present the new framework of uh, cities, culture, creativity, uh, developed by UNESCO and World Bank and published last May. Uh, it is uh, also uh, our honor that we learned a lot from Japan, Japanese experience, many Japanese cities uh, and their creative cities and supporting the creative economy generally. And uh, I would like to share with you today um, our um, paper, a uh, position paper with UNESCO, and we would like to have good discussion afterwards. Um, I would like also to acknowledge, first of all, uh, this is a joint work UNESCO and World Bank, as well as uh, generous uh, co-sponsorship and co-finance from government of Japan and Tokyo Development through Tokyo Development Learning Center and participating city. Uh, so to start, um, just uh, some definition of the creative cities. Uh, you know, many of you perhaps know that creative cities are those cities which have uh, effectively enabled culture and creative industries uh, known as CCI to contribute to their urban and socioeconomic uh, development. And in doing that, many of these cities focus on the whole ecosystem of um, enabling private sector with its more large creative economy to flourish and to attract and to grow. Uh, what, uh, when we call culture and creative industries, so what fields or what sectors we mean here? Um, after a review of the literature and as well as discussion with UNESCO and many stakeholders, we decided to define uh, culture and creative industries for the purpose of the position paper in seven fields. Uh, the first one is uh, audiovisual and interactive media that may include uh, film, TV and radio, streaming, broadcast, video games, and so on. Second one is the very well-known field for many of you, of you, which is the Intangible Culture Heritage, or ICH. And that's a well-known field uh, by UNESCO, uh, including uh, you know, all, everything like um, culinary knowledge, the oral traditions, hand and crafts, and so on. Um, the other one is performing art, including drama, dance, festivals, live music. Um, we have also the literature and press, including books, newspaper, publication, libraries, magazine. Number five is the visual arts and crafts, including fine arts, photography, crafts, Number six is design and creative services, including architecture, fashion, graphic design, interior design. And finally, the heritage and tourism activities, including uh, uh, museums, uh, archeological sites, and historical places. So why culture and creative industries? Um, 
We have seen in many of Japanese experiences, cities, as well as globally, that uh, strategic uh, support to the culture and creative industries, they have what we call triple if, if benefits for the local uh, development. They have a special impact or outcome, uh, including in urban regeneration and development of places or communities where such arts are produced, economic impact on in income generating uh, generation, job creation, and social impact in terms of inclusion and uh, social capital uh, and networking. It's a sector which contributes $2.25 trillion uh, revenues or 3% of global GDP. Uh, it has significant contribution to global ex exports estimated at 500 million uh, billions, as well as 3% share of creative jobs. It's a sector which employs the young people and women and most and, and many of the people who have skills uh, uh, but live in marginalized areas or, or the, on the outskirts. But it also it's a sector that has its own challenges um, in terms of uh, enabling uh, physical and uh, regulatory environment to be productive and to, uh, for the knowledge and skills to go uh, through it from one generation to another. UNESCO and World Bank partnered for a long time, and we have published uh, another paper before called Culture in City Reconstruction and Recovery, which actually talked about how culture can be in the heart of the recovery process. And then came the pan pan uh, COVID pandemic, which actually uh, uh, confirm the importance of culture again to be in the heart of the COVID recovery. So in the course of preparing the position paper, we reviewed a lot of lit literature mentioned in the screen. We had nine in-depth case studies, including two cases from Japan, uh, Kyoto and Kobe, which my friends will present in details, but also uh, other uh, cities globally, uh, which we'll present later. And uh, we reviewed also in boxes uh, additional cases uh, from around the world. We had uh, several rounds of consultation, most notably during a technical deep dive that the government of Japan uh, hosted just before the pandemic. And we learned a lot from, we went to Kobe and Kyoto. We had delegations from eight countries who exchanged knowledge and learned from Japan, as well as we had international conferences and rounds of experts experts. So some of the key findings uh, of the report is that creative industries have a strong potential to contribute to special economic and social development outcomes. And as we hear today, the Kyoto case, we will see with empirical evidence how uh, such sectors contributed to the transformation of the city, which we observe in many other cities that we covered under the case study. They help to drive urban transformation because these skills exist. So they, they have the uh, uh, interest, communities have interest to regenerate and cities have interest to gener regenerate these areas, revitalize urban and rural areas to enable the production and reproduction. They provide, em provide employment opportunities for women and youth and employ low and middle income in, in, middle, uh, in low and middle income countries, uh, significant uh, higher rates than in industrialized countries, employ the young, especially young people. Uh, they are not only concentrated in cities, also we see larger production in cities, but we see also um, revitalized towns uh, also as epic centers of productions. Okay, so if a city, or a town has what we call the endowments, the assets, the resources in terms of artists, creative capital, or intangible cultural heritage. So that is the framework which would like to present to you. These are in the heart. These are the endowments if you have people or resources or skills. And you would like to reach the three outcomes which you showed shown in the, uh, in the outer circle which are the special benefits of transformation, economic benefits, and social benefits. So what can we do as policymakers to foster and enable the ecosystem of cities to, to, to support the production, to attract and maintain uh, uh, the creators? 
uh, reviewing all global experience showed that different cities do different things, but we can put them, group them under what we call now six enablers. So if you are a policymaker and you have a gap, you identify a gap under any of these six enablers, you may consider working on this area so that you provide more enabling environment for the producers. And so I will present them quickly, but the next session, each of my colleagues will present them in details. The first one is the urban infrastructure and livability, the regeneration. If people would like to produce and they don't have reliable water, electricity, communication, Wi-Fi, fiber optics, they cannot, they cannot produce. So the whole thing is to get the physical infrastructure, physical environment for them. Second is the human dimension, the skills and innovation, invest in people, invest in vocational training, invest in masters who can tran transmit this knowledge uh, transgenerationally. The third one is a short social network as catalyzers or support and, 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 and access to finance. Number four, the inclusive institutions, regulations and partners. We heard in cases like Kobe, for example, the creative director or creative council. These are institutions to enable this to grow and happen and respond to challenges producers face. The number five is the uniqueness, how to maintain the uniqueness of, of, of such assets and the creativity. Number six and final one is the digital environment, digital transformation, including access to markets, social, uh, sharing economy, and all this digital transformation uh, that can help them uh, access market and promote. Um, these are the case studies, which you can see, you will see in the report that covered in depth. Uh, and in conclusion, I would like to share with you just a, a few messages as takeaway before we go into details uh, of each enabler. Uh, the first one is that creative cities play a critical role in enabling inclusive economic growth, uh, social inclusion, and well being. And particularly at the time of COVID, uh, we have seen in many cases with evidence that. The culture and creative industries was resilience, resilient and enabled um, the faster recovery uh, and income to people. So it was more resilient to shocks um, and uh, not necessarily COVID, but other shocks as well. Uh, cities seeking to enhance the resilience of culture and creative industries and their impact on neighborhoods, city competitiveness and communities would benefit from if you want to do it, our experience showed that first of all, we need to map the, uh, these cultural and creative industries. So we know what we have in hand, identify key constraints through consultation with those uh, creators, uh, see what constraints they have. And then based on that, prioritize the interventions. It may be within the six enabling areas we presented, but you may find something else. So try to respond to needs and challenges. And finally, building and empowering effective uh, coalitions. Uh, with, uh, with the bank and with uh, Tokyo uh, TDLC, we try to operationalize that. Uh, so we have several requests from our delegation, our, our client countries, to continue learning the experience of Japan. And uh, we have a project, a few projects now started to operationalize it. For example, uh, Ganzo revitalization and innovation project in China, 650 million joint World Bank and IFC program together also with UNESCO and UNWTO. It's now well under implementation as well as, as, well as in other countries like Lebanon. So we look forward hearing your feedback and uh, we see how we continue working together and benefit uh, from Japan's great experience and knowledge. Thank you very much. I will turn it back now to Haruka. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alphabet, for your excellent presentation. I think it was a good way to really open up the Creative City concept to the, to the audience. Now, I would like to close this session, but please drop any questions or comments you have into this chat box because we are going to continue with the panel discussion. Uh, I would like to invite Ahmed to be the moderator for discussion. So back to you, Ahmed.
Would you like to maybe you like to hear your voice? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haruka. So now we would like to, uh, I will, uh, we have a fantastic uh, panelists who will uh, take this framework into a greater level of details. Uh, uh, we have um, uh, five, four speakers, uh, Aya, Victor, Riku, and Dimitri. And I would like to present, to introduce each one of them. Uh, we'll start with Aya who will present to us uh, Enabler number one on urban infrastructure livability, uh, as well as enabler number four in inclusive institutions. We have a Victor who will present enabler number two on skills innovation and enabler number three on social networks. Rikov, our dear friend from UNESCO, who will present the uh, cultural and creative industries and in intangible culture heritage enabler number five. And then uh, our dear friend Dimitri, who worked a lot with Kobe to present the overall governance approach and economic benefits of creative cities uh, uh, agenda. So we will start now uh, with uh, Aya. And uh, Aya is a senior urban development specialist in Latin America and Caribbean region. She worked previously in the Middle East. She, she has great knowledge on uh, competitiveness and economic cities. She is currently leading the urban and territorial, territorial development uh, projects uh, in, in several countries, especially in Argentina and Chile. Uh, until recently, she led, she is a co-author of this report, uh, as well as uh, other, re other uh, results-based financing. Aya, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, can you all hear me? Okay, perfect. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. And as Ahmed said, um, we're gonna dive deeper um, as, as panelists into the enablers of this framework. So first and foremost, um, enabler one, um, which is on physical and spatial environment, essentially comes down to, you know, where do people want to live and where can creatives create best, right? And so, here, the, the two pieces of physical and spatial environment that we zoom in on in the report are first, uh, what enables effective spaces for production and for the dissemination or consumption of creative activities. Um, and some of this is, is not specific to creative and cultural industries, but a lot of it is actually quite specific to them. So for instance, creatives, artists, they need um, specific spaces some that are provided by public entities like governments, some by civil society, some by private entities, but spaces that allow for them to have access to the types of equipment, the types of large free, free wielding spaces that allow them to produce. And so that might include um, marketplaces and marketplaces that are more configurable um, and modular and reconfigurable than maybe had been the case in the past, spaces that allow for pop-ups and for allow for different kinds of creative activity to be produced and, and consumed. Um, cultural venues like theaters, libraries that have spaces that can be used for productions. Um, and then some spaces that again, might be provided more by the private sector and civil society like recording studios, artist workshops, et cetera. Um, what is, critical across these different types of spaces is that they bring together the range of infrastructure and services that these creatives need um, so that they have the, the totality of what's needed in such a space. Um, and there are models of top-down provision of this kind of an enabling environment, and there are models of bottom-up um, provision of this. And, and we go through both in the report. Um, it tends to be the case that the bottom-up models are more successful more often. But as you'll see in the report, we showcase Seoul Digital Media City, which was a government-driven approach to creating spaces for production of digital media, um, as well as places where people can live. And, and that has been a success. Um, there's also, there are a few cases that we have in the report on bottom-up approaches and one in specific, which is quite interesting, which is in Johannesburg in South Africa, um, where a number of artists and food producers were, were seeking affordable spaces um, for markets and the city gave them underutilized parking spaces and warehouses for weekend markets for food and art. And that dynamic then catalyzed a whole set of activity in these neighborhoods that had otherwise been depressed 
Um, and it created a bit of a virtuous cycle where then the neighborhoods were able to access more resources and invest in upgrading the neighborhoods. Um, and so that, that gives a very interesting example of one of these kind of bottom-up approaches to creating or reutilizing spaces um, for creatives and then for the neighborhood itself to flourish. And then the second part, as I mentioned, is about creating spaces or, or enabling spaces to be affordable for creatives to live. Um, and so this is where cities that have done a good job in managing gentrification dynamics and making sure that there is accessible housing have done well when it comes to enabling uh, creative industries. Um, an interesting example is London, where um, an effort had been made to make access to housing in downtown London in the areas where there were a lot of musical venues accessible to musicians so that the musicians could live near the places where they were performing. Um, that was a, an effort that, that delivered tremendous results there. Um, so that's enabler one. Um, on enabler four, which is on institutional and regulatory environment, um, you know, we talk about it, the importance of an enabling institutional and regulatory environment in general, but we also zoom in on a few kind of goals in specific and how different cases illustrate the importance of these goals. So one is on diversity. Um, there's a lot of empirical evidence on the correlation between diversity and innovation. And in the report, you'll see that probably for most of the cases actually that we zoom in on, there is a dimension of diversity enabling kind of cross-pollination and more, an environment that's allowed for more cultural and creative industry development. So Kobe in Japan is an interesting case where because of the port and the fact that the port brought together people from different cultures with different ideas, there was a lot of innovation in different creative industries. Um, and the second really good example is in Lima, Peru, where gastronomy has just taken off tremendously, um, driven, in large part by the influences in, in their culinary traditions, which come from Japan, from China, from countries in Africa, Latin America, um, from indigenous populations. And that combination has created just a, a phenomenal gastronomy scene in Lima that has also been exported overseas. Second, and I'll go super quickly because I know we want to have time to hear your questions, um, freedom of expression is extremely critical. Um, and so we see that places that enable that tend to have more flourishing literature, media, music, film scenes. Um, third, protection of precarious workers. This has become especially important under COVID-19. A lot of the people working in cultural creative industries are in either the informal sector or have um, short-term contracts. And so being in places where there are safety nets for them becomes really critical. And so you see more flourishing of the arts in places that offer such safety nets. And then affordability, as I just mentioned in the previous enabler, um, institutions that help fight gentrification and, and support people to be able to access, um, you know, creatives to access the spaces where they are demanded um, is extremely important also for um, the vibrancy of creative cities. Um, and lastly, intellectual property is especially important. And we have a very interesting case from Kingston, Jamaica, that showcases how um, the city was losing, despite the fact that it's the Mecca of reggae, it had a lot of its reggae artists going to North America um, to record. And, and so the national government and the city government introduced a number of measures to protect copyrights and the collection of royalties, which then contributed to a shift back towards production in Kingston. I will leave it at that and hand it back to you, Ahmed. Thank you very much, Aya. Uh, we will go now to uh, uh, Victor Mullas, who will present to us enabler number two and three. And Victor perhaps is a well uh, very well-known person to you. He's a team leader of uh, Tokyo Development Learning Center. He's a senior urban specialist, and he has great, great deep knowledge uh, in terms of uh, acceleration programs, innovation, startups, and cities across the regions. Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, so we've uh, heard from Maja already from Enabler 1 and 4. So we basically have the infrastructure, the environment uh, to uh, uh, start with the creativity and the, in, uh, the regulatory enabling environment. So we have these two elements. So what is next? And that's, uh, I'm gonna touch in the 
uh, two next enablers, and then uh, uh, Reiko and, and Dimitri will complement in this journey we are taking you. So cities are very important for creativity. And what Aya was described is the uh, environment physical and uh, uh, regulatory around cities. And we've seen that uh, talent, creative talent concentrates in cities. We've seen that uh, since uh, Richard Florida started the studies, but that has been confirmed also with WIPO in terms of innovation or Nesta in terms of creativity. It's, it's, it's a phenomenon that we are seeing. So uh, why is that? Well, because cities attract uh, two things that are very important. It attracts uh, human capital and in serious number and concentrate it so they can interact. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. Uh, skills and innovation, which at the end is human cap capital. And then the social networks, which is in, at the end, the ecosystem, the structure to, uh, for this human capital to interact and grow in their journey of going from the idea uh, that they are having to actually creating uh, 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 an industry about creativity that re uh, develops in employment. So basically it's going from invention to innovation, right? Or the uh, basic idea to art in itself. So uh, in human capital, that's uh, uh, obviously is needed. You need creators uh, to, to reach out creativity, right? Uh, and that is people, uh, but then also need the skills. So they, they may be very creative people, but if you don't get the uh, right skills, it's very difficult for them to develop uh, uh, um, the creative industries that we are looking into, right? So uh, what we've found is formal uh, skills on creativity and art are very important and embedding them in the curriculum of students in primary, secondary and university, it's important. Uh, those uh, cities and countries that do that tend to have more uh, creativity around it. So there was a lot of talk in the 90s about uh, coding skills and STEM education. And now we have realized, or we are seeing the tendency that now it's about the STEAM, we add an A, an A there, which is arts, right? So that goes into creativity is also very important. And that's gonna be very important as we move forward because we are seeing the economy going into automation of routine tasks and routine jobs. So we're gonna need more creativity to create new jobs. So that goes into that, it becomes even more and more relevant. But this formal education is not enough. We also need to complement with informal education. And that goes into the, the, the traditions, the arts and crafts traditions that are Pass uh, from people that know about it, but it's not formal, and, and know all these uh, insights that are intangible and passes to, uh, to to the new generation. And that usually it's about apprentices and learning on the job. It's about uh, uh, hands-on learning. So all these uh, systems needs to uh, be in place. In some places it exists already. So for instance, if you go to uh, the south of Spain in flamenco, it, that it's already happening. Uh, you go to a small towns in Italy. That's already happening, for instance, for the creation of arts and crafts. Uh, but what if you don't have it? So then it's where you can start looking into apprentices programs. You can also look into boot camps that are happening. Uh, so for instance, uh, they, they, they are very uh, successful examples on boot camps for uh, learning the basic tax in gastronomy that were done in, in, in Peru, for instance. And, and that's very important because you not only create the initial workers to get into the industry, but uh, you allow them to introduce themselves into, into the industry and grow in the hand, uh, with hands-on experience into becoming a chef from this time, going from just helping in the kitchen to becoming a chef. But you need the basic skills to be able to be in the kitchen. So how do you get that and accelerate? So, so those are things that we've seen uh, works uh, well in terms of, of, of the skills. But as I said before, skills is not enough. We also need... Uh, an ecosystem, uh, an iteration that goes with it. Because you can be a great creator, but you don't know what to do with your creativity. How do you transform this into a business or how do you transform that into something valuable that you can uh, show to the world or even to, to, to a greater scale than just your friends and family, right? Um, and that is where uh, we, we found those ecosystems sometimes exist and have been there for a while. So if you go to Jamaica and Kingston, music and reggae, it's all around, right? And, and that's naturally happening. There are a lot of places where you can play and train and meet some people, and then they will tell you how to do things. And then there, there are radio studios to record and, and the industry is there. The same in Bamako in Mali, right? Or Buenos Aires with the Spanish rock. And you have that already, but what if you don't have it? So that is where we are started to look at what things can change and become these ecosystems and accelerate them in your city. So that leads us into what we call catalyzers. And catalyzers are individuals and spaces that create those social networks and link with what we call the support infrastructure, which is basically that mentorship, 
and that access to finance and knowledge to grow your uh, artistic or creative uh, industry idea. Uh, so catalyzers can be individuals or can be uh, spaces or uh, organizations. So individuals, uh, uh, a case in point is, uh, and Aya mentioned that in Lima, Peru, uh, it's uh, uh, Gascon Acurio, for instance, who, who is uh, the individual that basically helped creating the whole uh, gastronomy uh, industry in, in Peru. So why he made a difference? Well, uh, he was able to go to Paris, learn the skills on the networks, and then bring it to Peru and get the finance and start uh, developing a very successful restaurant with projection internationally, thanks to his, his network. And then he brought that back to the ecosystem and trained people and co-invest with other uh, individuals and they started creating like a, like, like a critical mass. But we have seen that you can do that also with organizations. You don't only have to rely on, on specific individuals. So for instance, in Barcelona, the, the local government is uh, developing what they call factories of, cre of creativity. And those are just spaces that have these kind of programs to create the skills and support uh, creativity uh, in different individuals and connect them also with people that are more professional and resources. And they are doing that at the neighborhood level. So they start creating mini neighborhoods of creativity and then connecting them through the city and then through the network the city have in international uh, projection. You also have more advanced uh, systems like art incubators, for instance, the Brooklyn Art Incubator. And you have just spaces uh, um, for uh, organizations that develop events or festivals, like music festivals, that would attract uh, a lot of different international bands, but also producers, uh, but also agents that are looking for new artists, right? Um, so, so those are things that help creating this ecosystem. Uh, I have a different kind of organizations that Jack, you can think of attracting to your city uh, with different models. Uh, but at the end, it's about creating this network of access to different resources that can be uh, mentors, that can be international connections, or can be finance that can help your, your talent in your city. So, so that gives uh, an overview of these two enablers. And now I pass it back to Ahmed. Thank you. Thanks so much, Victor. Very good presentation. Uh, now we go to enabler number five by our uh, dear friend, uh, Rico Yoshida. Uh, who is the head of the programs and stakeholders outreach unit of the diversity of culture expression entity, culture sector of UNESCO. Uh, Rico, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, good morning, everybody from early hours of Paris. Um, I just wanted to start by taking a step back just to recall that um, 2021 is the UN International Year of Creative Economy for Sustainable Development. And this um, year is calling UN agencies to work together. And this position paper between the World Bank and UNESCO symbolizes this ongoing strong partnership between the two organizations. And I wanted to start by thanking uh, the World Bank for this uh, fruitful collaboration. And it is also this publication came at the timely moment because this year, um, the world is celebrating the 20th anniversary of the universe, Universal Declaration of Cultural Diversity. And this declaration affirmed, among other things, the importance of equal access to art, including the digital form and access to the means of expression and dissemination for ensuring the free flow of ideas by word and image, and most of all, for the world's cultural diversity. And I think this uh, CCC framework is really about you know, how to maintain cultural diversity and use cultural diversity as engines for the city development. And this Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity was a precursor for the UNESCO Convention on the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, which was adopted in 2003, and the Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, which was adopted in 2005. And I work for the Secretariat of this 2005 convention, which is the conventions that supports the development of cultural industries around the world. And this 2005 convention, which hasn't been ratified by Japan, by the way, <laughs> we hope that Japan will soon join this uh, world of 150 uh, countries. It provides a legal weight to the concept of culture, goods and services as vectors of identity, values and meaning so it should not be treated as mere commodities or consumer goods. Indeed, uh, we are trying to promote the idea that art and culture are, uh, are the public goods requiring public support and public investment. And the CCC framework 
really uh, attest to this uh, idea. And considering the double nature of cultural goods and services, both having economic and cultural values, uh, this 2005 convention uh, provides states with a sovereign right to take policies and measures that are necessary to strengthen and promote their uh, cultural industries. And cultural industries is the heart of the creative economy, and they lie at the intersection of arts, culture, business, and technology. And CCIs are based on the creative capacity of people who make up diverse and dynamic organizations and enterprises. So now let me introduce you the enabler, enabler five, which is uniqueness. And in fact, the uniqueness is all about what identifies a city, the distinctiveness of the city. And it's about the city's identity and this unique uh, combination of intrinsic and related features allow the city to generate values, the intrinsic values, and attract and cultivate creative talent to come and audience that enjoy and consume those creative assets, cultural assets. And intangible culture heritage represents such a uniqueness for cities around the world. And intangible heritage is defined as practices, expressions, knowledge, and skills that communities pass on from generation to generation. And this CCC framework provides various information about how this unique uh, intangible heritage could be a source for creative cities development. And what is very important when uh, tapping into the creative, the intangible heritage as creative resource is the need to avoid over commercialization and commercial misappropriation and inappropriate mechanization or overproduction, manufacture or reproduction outside the community and loss of cultural value or meaning associated with the intangible heritage practice can lead to the deterioration of intangible heritage and loss of meaning for the people involved. So it is very important to consult and involve cultural heritage practitioners when tapping into this um, resource. And in order to identify what is unique about a given city, it is very important to map out and review urban cultural ecosystem to highlight, oh, my five minutes is up, to highlight um, the treasure that is existing. And to, to identify that, that uniqueness, the distinctiveness, it is very important to involve different stakeholders, culture stakeholders, but also non-culture stakeholders to make sure that people's voices are heard and the identity that the city defines for itself is something that is shared by the people themselves. And the bottom-up approach is, approach is very, very important. And the helping to identify these unique cultural resources is the added value of UNESCO. And we, we look forward to uh, continue our collaboration with the World Bank. And this CCC framework has been very significant and practically useful for us, uh, UNESCO's work, because it gives us the ground to go reach out to non-culture stakeholders. As you know, uh, UNESCO works with the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Culture often deals with more heritage and more um, traditional um, uh, culture. And the culture industries is often taken up by Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and it is important to have more inclusive, participatory, evidence-based approach to the development of culture industries. And the creative uh, this um, CCC framework allows us to leap into these uh, stakeholders that haven't been the, our stakeholders so far. And um, yeah, we are trying to uh, operationalize this uh, framework in Georgia, where we are. Uh, implementing technical assistance to develop uh, measures for creative cluster development. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Riko-san. A very good presentation. And Riko, just for the sake of uh, audience, she's a co-author of the position paper. And in doing that for the last two years, she mobilized a large number of uh, UNESCO staff and experts who contributed significantly uh, to our position paper. 
so before we go to the last uh, presenter today, uh, Dimitri, I would like to remind all of you that if you have any question or comments, please leave it in the chat box and we will pick them up uh, soon after uh, the next presentation. So the next one is uh, by Mr. Dimitri Sebavit. He is a uh, urban specialist working in the Europe and Central Asia region of the World Bank. Uh, he comes with huge uh, background and diverse uh, knowledge in terms of uh, competitive cities, urban infrastructure investment, territorial and regional development, uh, municipal finance. advisory services and infrastructure investment uh, projects in East Europe and Central Asia. This is a diverse region. Uh, Dimitri, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. I was uh, getting worried that like, I'm losing connection a little bit, but here I am. Uh, it's great to, um, to participate in this wonderful event and thanks a lot to TDLC for inviting me along. I think it was a great pleasure to participate in the development of the report. And I think I've learned a lot and I myself walked away with the feeling um, that I personally as an urban development practitioner practitioner have been, have been unaware and un have been underestimating the power of culture and creativity as a real, uh, really powerful and, 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 and versatile tool for addressing different challenges of urban development. Um, and that's uh, what I want to talk about. I kind of summarizing um, and adding to what my colleagues have been talking about. Um, I want to uh, you know, move kind of to the next step of implementing um, urban um, development initiatives informed by culture and creativity. Um, in, I like to think about it in the framework of what, who, how, and why, right? So what is, what do you need to do? And my colleagues spoke about different enablers that um, that uh, cities can tackle to, uh, to unlock and, 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 and advance development of creative uh, and, uh, and cultural activities and industries. Um, I wanna talk about a little bit about what, how we're using, um, using our uh, case study example that we've uh, covered in the report. So first of all, uh, what can a city achieve by, by tackling, um, by, by, by investing into development of uh, creative and cultural activities? Uh, in our framework, we identify three main uh, outcomes. And this is kind of a precursor to versatility of culture and creativity, creativity and urban development tool. Um, and our cases confirm this. So yes, there are examples of cities that primarily seek development of industrial clusters and aiding their economy. Uh, prime example here is probably Seoul or Kyoto that leveraged local um, potential uh, that they saw and invested into it to advance uh, certain segments of the economy. But at the same time, the same city is also mindful of spatial development. So um, Seoul in developing the uh, media city um, really combined a large scale urban um, upgrading and renovation operation uh, with, with um, industrial development targeted and well-planned and thought out industrial development that addressed needs of specific, of specific industries and businesses. Um, similarly, uh, the other, the other scale, Belgrade did something uh, similar where it identified little clusters of creative activity in different pockets of the city uh, and it backed them up and helped them out, uh, thus developing small economic growth centers that also contributed to uh, upgrading of selected neighborhoods of the city. So this shows you that um, cities are able to address multiple targets in the same kind of uh, part of the same strategy using uh, culture and creativity as the vehicle. Um, and then there are other types of interventions, right? So Mandal, um, Brazzaville, Agulem, Lima, those are the cities that had interventions that are focused on specific asset the gastronomy in Lima or mosaic tradition in Landaba in Jordan or a uh, fantastic music tradition of Brazil uh, in Congo. Um, and then there's a completely other side of the spectrum, uh, which is um, presented by cities like Santos and Kobe. Both these cities used culture and creativity as a vehicle predominantly for building social cohesion and addressing uh, challenges of 
of not quite just economic nature. Santos struggled historically or for a long time from high level of division, uh, pockets of poverty in the city, um, lack of social cohesion. And it used, uh, invested in building kind of bottom up creative clusters and build a special facility for creative villages to specifically uh, provide some um, source of relief and opportunity um, and coming and opportunities for coming together in specifically in, in poorer, more vulnerable neighborhoods. Uh, Kobe, of course, is the example of the city that invested in creativity as a vehicle for re re recovery and redevelopment of the city after a uh, very uh, destructing, dis disruptive, and very tragic earthquake. So, but this is to show you the, the versatility of goals that cities can pursue. Uh, can, can pursue. But the interesting part is that how cities can go about investing in creativity is also very different. I'll just speak of two different kind of parameters that can vary. First of all, um, I want to uh, uh, say that even the, among these examples that I was mentioning, um, the, the way um, uh, public and private actors come together and who leads differs, differs a lot. As my colleagues mentioned, Seoul is an example of a pretty broad, uh, top-down initiative where the city that has a great capacity at implementing very complex projects had a very complex initiative, well-designed, well-planned, uh, and it brought in um, businesses that populated the newly developed digital media city uh, at a later stage, when it was kind of already already planned and and take uh, made significant steps in implementing the initiatives, on the on the medium on the middle part of the scale is Kobe, where uh, a group of businesses came together with an idea of uh, becoming a member of uh, UNESCO Creative City Network, brought it to the mayor uh, to the city leadership, and city embraced it and took it forward and gave it new life. And then the other side of the spectrum we have Lima, where uh, the city completely kind of followed the lead of a community of, of um, chefs, of leaders of the gastronomic, gastronomic industry that sort of discovered the opportunity that uh, Peruvian uh, culinary tradition presents to the city, to the community, and to the people of Peru. So uh, this can work in very different ways, but what we see, as I mentioned, I think, is that situations where both um, public and private actors come together and combine to advance the, the agenda, um, those seem to will be most productive. Uh, and finally, the last aspect of how cities go about, or last category uh, of, of different ways to go about um, um, creative cities initiatives uh, would be about kind of the structure, um, how, how to organize this stuff. Um, and again, here I would focus on diversity. So uh, on the one side of the scale is Seoul, which is a city of huge capacity and that was able to have a very planned, very structured approach. It started from redeveloping the space, investing into infrastructure, investing into real estate, building programs for supporting uh, specific types of businesses and ensuring that they provide the facilities and spaces that this kind of businesses would need. It was entirely uh, public sector driven, but very, Thoroughly thought out, something that not many public sector actors could, could afford to do. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, here I would focus on Kobe. And the beauty of Kobe's initiative, as I said, it was an initiative um, promoting creativity that was in response to a tragic event. But what the city did is very unique. Um, they essentially created a framework of um, kinds of activities that the city can, can thrive in. They were about lifestyle, about manufacturing design, about uh, creating uh, creative spaces in the city. But the city only didn't invest in robust programs. It kind of established a couple of nodes, a couple of catalyzers to follow um, what, what Victor was presenting. It set up a design creativity center for Quito. Uh, it established a couple of positions like uh, creative industries manager um, or um, uh, creative director of the city. Uh, and give them certain responsibilities of promoting certain types of activities in the city, implementing certain um, social uh, development programs that use creativity, and sort of let it all be, and basically let a thousand flowers bloom. And over time, flowers did bloom, and they came from uh, groups of businesses 
from individuals um, that, that had new ideas and from within city government where new, um, new people took up these positions of creative directors and came up with, with new proposals. So basically what I wanna give you, a, give, give you a sense of is that there's a huge diversity of opportunities uh, that cities can pursue through uh, culture and creativity and a great variety of, of methods and of ways to organize the work around culture and creativity that cities have uh, been successful at. And I think our report um, shows this in more detail. And I think the main thing to take away uh, from that is that um, there's not a specific type of city for which this kind of approach and this kind of tool program development is uniquely relevant. It is actually, it actually can be adapted and adjusted to broad uh, diversity of contexts, capabilities, um, and challenges. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Uh, we, uh, so as we see, you know, we have seen the framework and its integrity. And as, I, as we said, this is to support the whole ecosystem of the city. It's not a prescriptive uh, recipe like all cities have to do this and that. Based on your own challenge, you, you see where are, um, what is needed, what's uh, requested by the producers, and then you see what public investment you can do. We received three very good questions. The first one is about access to finance, and I will turn to Victor to address. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, Reiko can compliment after uh, she highlighted they have a marvelous study uh, looking at this uh, with the with COVID. But in general, in terms of supporting artists, there, there are different measures we've been seeing. It's a variety of them. Uh, there's a general one just in terms of uh, providing the spaces and access to equipment, uh, sometimes new digital uh, 3D printers or traditional equipment for different industries like textile, or you want to do painting and things like that. So you have different facilities that are provided in general access and, and, and using them. Um, Finland is very interesting. They have an enormous library that they turn into a creativity, uh, a whole floor uh, uh, creativity venue. So you have a studio of music, if you want to use music, you have a studio for art, you have a, a studio for textiles and you have training too. Now there are uh, a, a trainers that will come and teach you about the arts and crafts and, and, and develop it. So that's one one. One way, then it goes to the point of artist residence uh, and, and, and even providing a space and residence for uh, some years. Uh, usually that's uh, paired with institutions like museums and art institutions. Um, and, 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 and that's uh, one way to go. But sometimes uh, municipalities are just developing art in residence uh, rent subsidies and creating like the affordable housing, but for artists. <laughs> and we, we saw some of that happening actually in, in, in Washington DC. Uh, in, in the, a new area of development and was a way to regenerate a neighborhood by bringing artists uh, that way and starting subsidizing uh, the generation by the private sector of this kind of uh, affordable housing that required to have a studio for the artists, right? So it's not only the, the resident itself, which was a small studio, but it's also the place to work, interact, and then uh, and develop. But uh, I'm gonna pass to Reiko because he probably has more to add on that. Um, thank you, Victor. Well, UNESCO's monitoring takes place at the level of the central government, so I'm not uh, very much aware of what is happening at the city level. But it's true that um, a lot of countries uh, do provide direct support to artists and cultural professionals, often through the uh, Arts Council. And I just sent a link to the latest publication that we made. And this is taking stock of various measures that the government has taken uh, around the world. To, to support the artists and cultural uh, professionals and the creative sectors. And a lot of countries did provide direct um, uh, funding support or commissioned and purchased uh, works of arts and compensated the loss of income and uh, provided uh, you know, training for skills development. So a lot of countries are starting to provide direct support to the artist. And just to inform you, that UNESCO uh, back in 1980 uh, adopted the recommendation on the state of the artist. And uh, we make um, every four years a monitoring of the implementation of this uh, recommendation on the state of the artist. And we'll soon be um, launching a survey. 
uh, to, to the government, we have more information about what is exactly happening in favor of uh, the artist. And uh, we will make this information available in uh, 2023, I believe. Thank you. Great, thank you. So as we come to conclusion now, uh, just there was a one comment about, you know, uh, this intangible culture has existed for forever, for centuries. So what's new now? And the difference between this and culture and creative industries, that's very good, smart comment and very much agree. Uh, and, uh, and the role of influencer and catalyzers, very, very sharp observation. And the second one was uh, what triggered the attention to creative cities industries now? And if there were any triggers or cases, I would be curious to know. I think, uh, the UNESCO uh, network of creative cities brought all the cities together and it showed that there is a need for greater uh, global knowledge sharing among creators and that actually what triggered it and we tried to document it in the, in the, in the framework and in the position paper. So thank you so much for all questions and comments. I'll turn it now to Haruka to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reiko, Ahmed, Aya, Dimitri, and Victor. Um, I thought I knew about Creative Cities given I was also co-authoring a uh, part of just the section, but today I learned new things. So uh, thank you so much for your time and thank you audience for your active participation. I think it was very interactive despite the distance. I trust that your, our audience have found it extremely useful and also insightful. I also want to send a big thank you uh, for our participants for joining us today. I know it's pretty early in the morning in Japan. Uh, this is just round one of our Creative City event series. Uh, so please stay tuned for round two, uh, where we will explore in practice uh, the enablers presented today uh, through the case study on Kyoto City, I own Japan TLC, uh, organizes talk on a wide range of urban development topics. Uh, so if you are looking to learn more, uh, please check out our website uh, or SNS, SNS channels via Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, we, we believe our next uh, series is likely happening in later autumn, so stay tuned. Well, thank you again, and we look forward to having you back. Have a great rest of the morning, and for those of you joining from the other side of Europe and, and, and the continent, thank you so much for joining. Bye-bye.